Well, it's, uh, it's been calculated that in the past 3,500 years, there have only been 230 years of peace in the world. Let that sink in. 3,500 years of human history from today backwards, 230 years of peace. So America as a nation is 243 years old and has known only 18 years of peace. It's pretty staggering to think about. I, I begin with this because it's interesting that the book of Exodus begins with, with the nation of Israel facing the biggest enemy on the face of the planet, right? Pharaoh, his armies, they're enslaved, there's death, there's murder. Uh, it, you couldn't get any worse. Like, this is the enemy that they're facing. And then God, as we've seen, shows up, moves them, saves them, brings them out uh, through these magnificent plagues, these horrifying plagues against Egypt, brings them through the water, saves them. Right? We, we, we've seen God work on their behalf. Last week we saw all of these instructions for the tabernacle, and then we get to today. Right? You, you reach the pinnacle of everything that God has been doing, all of these promises. And as the book of Exodus begins to, to wind up, we see the enemy is not outside of them. The enemy is inside of them. That the biggest enemy that they now face is themselves, right? So Pharaoh's gone, dead. The Egyptian army has been wiped out. And now we see that the, the biggest enemy for them is not external to them. And it's a beautiful picture for us that our biggest enemy as well is not outside of us, but what lies inside of us, right? So the, the reality, you, we can go 3,500 years and 230 years of peace. The reality is that the minute you become a Christian, there is a war taking place. There is a war in your soul, a war in your heart, a war against the old man. Right? That's what Paul calls our old flesh. I'm not talking about the guy that lives down the street, the old man. Leave him alone. I'm talking about your own flesh. That day by day, moment by moment, the war in your life is against your old flesh, the old nature, your old self that roots itself in your heart. Jesus says in, in Luke 6, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. In other words, everything about our lives, our actions, our behaviors, our dreams, our hopes, our words, our, our emotions, everything about us finds its, itself rooted in our heart. So, so the, the reality for us is our enemy, their enemy is not Pharaoh. Their enemy is not this distant conquering force. Our enemy is not you know, some, some foreign power to us. It's, it's in us. And so it's very profound that we, we see last week the giving of all of these rules um, and expectations and um, diagram after diagram after list after list and detail upon detail of this is how I'm going to draw near to you. And then we get to this morning and see the absolute need for that. So we, we go from this pinnacle of what God has been doing to almost the, the depths of despair as we look at chapters 32 to 34 this morning. What I want you to see um, that, that's just laid out crystal clear for us in these three chapters is that God's abundant grace is greater than the atrocity of our sin. God's abundant grace is greater than the atrocity of our sin. And I think you need to hear that this morning. I need to be reminded of that this morning. The songs that we sing, the prayers that we offer, those are all attempts to remind us this morning of that great reality. God's grace is greater still. And the way that's possible, as we'll see in our second point this morning, is because of someone standing in the gap. So what I want you to see first in chapter 32, 1 to 6, the text that was read for us, is the atrocity of sin the atrocity of their sin. But again, as we see, and I've said this before, it's so important for us as we see brokenness and sin and idolatry in the Bible, it's so easy for us to shake our head and point our fingers and, and utter remarks against them, whether it's Adam and Eve, whether it's here and it's, it's the Egypt, or not the Egyptians, the Israelites and Aaron. It's so easy for us to, to wag our heads, and yet it's a picture of our own idolatry. It's a picture for us this morning of pulling back the curtain on our heart and saying, this is your heart as well. It is my heart as well. So we were created to worship. 
Right? The Israelites were created to worship. Humanity was created to worship. Right? Go to concerts and you see that. People raising their hands. Right? Cold plays playing. People raising their hands. Why? I didn't tell them to raise their hands. It's worship. Right? We were created to worship. To worship means to ascribe value to something. It's not a particularly religious term. It just means that your heart wants to praise something, right? To adore something, right? To cherish something, right? Think about when you're first in love with someone. These are the, the words that we use when we describe our relationship with that other person. We adore them. We cherish them. Why? Because we were created to worship. Another synonym for worship is to idolize something, right? To idolize means to... to to pursue something with blind adoration or devotion. And that's what happens in worship. When it's not centered on what you were created to worship, you will worship anything, everything around you. That's the, the reality of our hearts. We were created to worship. You see this so vividly in the Lord of the Rings series, right? This simple little ring, right? It changes this, this hobbit, Smeagol, into who? Gollum my precious, right? He's taken something. Go watch that this afternoon. Just spent the past couple weekends watching that series with our kids. It's profound to see the reality of worship turned in on itself, this small little object turning into idolatry. And that's what happens with us. It begins to control us and manipulate us. Right? Idolatry, which, which is at the heart of, again, worship that's not set on what it's supposed to be set on, Idolatry shifts to something that now controls us. It manipulates us. And simply put, idolatry is when you treasure anything other than God for ultimate significance. Right? So you take something good. So everything in life that God has given us is good. And we distort that. And when you move something good to the place of something being ultimate, it's idolatry. Or you look for ultimate meaning and ultimate satisfaction in something that can't provide ultimate satisfaction for you is idolatry. It's, it's like a vacuum, right? So when you, for instance, I, I know this happens at our house, like you clean out a closet, you clean out a cabinet, you clean out a drawer, and then a week later you look and it's full of stuff again, right? I, maybe that's not, that doesn't happen in your eyes. It happens at ours. Like you spend all this time organizing, cleaning, putting things away. It's now empty, like just magically, it's full of junk again, right? It, that's how idolatry works, right? That when there's a vacuum in your heart, a vacuum in your soul, and God is not there, like you do not set your heart and your affections on God, it will be filled with all kinds of junk, right? Just like this closet that you go, I just cleaned it last week. It's full of stuff already, right? That's what happens with idolatry. When God is not ultimate in your life, anything will be. Everything will be. The back of the, the room on the, the table, I printed off this sheet. It's adapted from Tim Keller's book uh, on idolatry. Great resource for you. Um, and kind of outlines 20 different idols for us. But the, the, the telltale sign for us is if, if we're struggling with idolatry, is to, to fill in the blank. Right? My life will only have ultimate significance. My life only has meaning if. Fill in the blank. And again, those are good things that shift to the place of being primary or ultimate for us. When our ultimate satisfaction is placed in anything or anything other than God, we begin to, to worship false gods, idolatry, sin. And that's the, the atrocity that we begin to see here. Listen to verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, they gathered together themselves against Aaron. The word together there is really against. Against Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. Right? And so as you begin to diagnose sin and diagnose idolatry in your own heart, there are all kinds of reasons. Right? It's easy to to see the sin in our life. We've got to get beneath the surface. And that's what idolatry and, and looking at these kinds of questions does for us is it gets beneath the surface of sin in our life to deal with, with the real issue and the sin beneath the sin in our lives. 
And so these questions of ultimate significance and the things that matter more than they should in our lives drive us to these kinds of things. So impatience and doubt and boredom, right? We, we live in a culture of instantaneous everything, right? We've been having internet issues this week, right? So they've been at our place multiple times, right? And I told the guy the other day, look, this is, the reality is these are first world problems, right? And he scratched his head and said, I'm surprised you would say that because most places, if this is the, the internet satisfaction that they had, they would, they would kill me. And, but I just, I mean, this is first world problems. But the reality is we live with instantaneous everything, right? Pop it in the microwave, it's done. Hit Amazon, it's there in two days. And when it's not, we get frustrated because we live in this culture, in this context where everything is instant. Everything is visible. Everything is tangible. And so the minute Moses has now been gone, they've been gone, he's been gone 40 days, they begin to doubt. They begin to struggle. They begin to wrestle with, well, where is he? Where is God? If he's our representative, where is God? Let's go ahead and pursue Aaron and have him fashion something for us. It's amazing in the book of Exodus thus far, the word sin has appeared seven times in 31 chapters. Not very much. And now all of a sudden in chapter 32 and 34, it's there 11 times. Like This is the pinnacle of idolatry, the pinnacle of their worshiping of things other than God. Sin. It's in the verse 2 through the first half of verse 4. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Idolatry is never passive. Sin is never passive in your life. There is always an active pursuit in your heart, in your life, with your drive and desires and emotions. It is always active. And we see that here. Contrary to what Aaron will go on to say toward the end of the chapter, is is him actively fashioning this for the people. They take off the gold. They bring it to him. Idolatry is never passive. And the atrocity comes, so in verse 30, um, God is communicating, um, or Moses communicates to the people, you've sinned a great sin. So the great sin is not just that they've broken the first and second commandment. Remember, we saw this a couple weeks ago, the first commandment, uh, don't worship false gods. God says, I am it. Don't worship false gods. And the second commandment is don't worship the true God in false ways. Don't create for yourself idols. And what we see here is now they blend these two things together, true worship and false worship together, and that becomes the atrocity. That becomes the great sin. Not just that they're fashioning for themselves an idol, but they're blending together these two ideas. Look at verse, second half of verse four through six. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast, not to the the golden calf, but to Yahweh. Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. The very two things that were the establishment of God's covenant with them, they're now bringing, they're now offering to God with a golden calf there, blending together these two forms of worship. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You bet they did. So syncretism is a theological word that means to blend together. It's an amalgamation, right? You take what what God commands, what God prescribes, and what we desire as well. And we, we take, and we do this all the time in our Christian life. We take what God demands of us, what we would like to do, we blend them together, baptize it, and think God's going to be okay with this. And God is not okay with it. Remember chapter 24, verse 11, this meal they're having on top, the 74 people that are there. It says they beheld God and ate and drank. And here it's, they, they sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. Right, there's a, a, a an approachability, there's a a lack of reverence here that just smacks in this text with the word play. 
Again, we've seen God is uncompromisingly holy. If there's one thing that Exodus has shown us is that we approach God on his terms, not ours. And so they think by offering these offerings, worshiping God, this feast to Yahweh with a golden calf there, it's okay. But it's not. Years ago, I heard the statement that modern cultures worship at their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. We don't work at work and play at play and worship at worship. Now we, we spin everything on its head. So you work 70 hours a week at the altar to get a paycheck, right? And you will, you'll devote 40 hours a week to your hobbies, right, playing. And then we come before God and, and we just play. And think that God is okay with how we approach him by baptizing idolatry. God is not okay with it at all. This is at the heart of what Paul says in Romans 1. They've exchanged the glory of God for images resembling birds and animals and creeping things. They've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Exchange who God is for something that we can control. What what we can manipulate what we can domesticate, right? And the reality is that those words don't apply to God. We cannot control God, manipulate God, or domesticate God. Rather, we are called ourselves to submit and surrender everything that we are to God. Ever wonder why it's a golden calf, not something else? Well, here they're reverting back to what they knew, right? In Egypt, we saw the fifth plague was... A plague against the livestock, right? And this this God from Egypt, Apis, the God of fertility, right? God of power, right? So they're taking one aspect, one attribute of who God is and running full bore with it. And we do the same thing today. The the most popular of of all of those at this point in human history, in American history, in Western Christianity is love, right? You've heard this. God is love. God is a God of love, and that is true, but not at the expense of God's holiness, not at the expense of God's mercy, not at the expense of God's justice, not at the expense of God's power. So yes, God is a God of love, and yet it is one of the most distorted aspects of who God is in today's culture. So the many worship around this altar and take out their earrings, and they would, if they could, fashion I don't know what it would look like. Probably not a a young calf. Probably a a golden heart. Look at God is love. Yes. But never at the expense of his other attributes. Never. When we do that, we miss all that God is for us. And we distort our worship into one aspect of who God is. I've heard over the years, countless times, my God would never fill in the blank. My God would never allow that. My God would never sanction that. My God would never. And the reality is that's probably true because you've fashioned for yourself an image of of a God that you now worship that is not all-inclusive of everything that God is in his word. And so my God would never is probably a true statement. Your God would never, but the God of the Bible has full jurisdiction to do what he does and operate how he does because of how he reveals himself in Scripture. So it's more than what we see or more than what we feel. It's so important to be reminded that in the fall, everything about us is impacted, right? Even our minds, right? It's easy to see the the actions in our lives, the behavior in our lives and see, well, clearly it's sinful, but every aspect of our lives has been impacted by sin. That's why it's so important to go time and again back to the revealed Word of God. What is What does God say about himself? How does he reveal himself in the word? That's why it's so profound that God reveals himself to us. He doesn't leave us in the dark, fumbling around, trying to figure out who he is. Very clearly, very graciously reveals himself to us in his word and now calls us to live in light of that. But when we don't, that's why you see this language that's used in verse 7, that they've corrupted themselves. Right? They've corrupted their idea of who God is, their worship of him. They've corrupted themselves. 
Greg Beal, in his book, We Become What We Worship, which if you'd like to borrow, another book this week, um, makes, makes the statement that we resemble what we revere for our ruin or restoration. What he means is that we really do become what we worship, right? They are called to be holy as God is holy. And in their pursuit of God and in their obedience to God, they become like God. They become holy. When we worship God and pursue God and rest in God, we, like, the, like that call there, become holy. So they are called to be holy, and yet what they become is cattle. So the, the point that Greg makes in this book, we see in this text. So a couple of verses to point out this reality. They become what they worship. We become what we worship. You hear that all the time. Right? You are what you eat. <laughs> the, the reality is your, your worship really impacts who you are, and you be, begin to become like those very things. So look at verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. It's the first time that phrase is used in the Bible, and it is now, from this point on, is used many times. Right, you, many of you worked around animals. Right, we were at the fair a couple weeks ago, and you see this poor kid like dragging out this lamb so that he could show it. And the lamb's like, I'm not going that way. No, come this way. No, I'm going that way. Right? You know, if you've got kids. If you've got kids, you know that. They were going this way. No, we're not. I said, go right. No, I'm going left. Like, come up here. No, I'm staying back here. Right? The, the heart of this is the imagery of livestock, is the imagery of cattle. I said, go this way, God says. And the people say, no, I'm not going there. Right? This stiff Necked, rebellious people. Stubborn. Right? The, the other place we see this, there's one more we'll look at as we end this morning as kind of, a, kind of a point that God makes at the end. But verse 25, we see the very same language being used. When Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp. Right, so like cattle, this image, they pushed past the fence. Now they're wandering everywhere. They're floating down the river. Whatever's happening, they're not where they're supposed to be. Right, they've broken out. Right, in their worship of this golden calf, they've become like this golden calf. Like this calf. Stiff-necked, disobedient, rebellious, not following what God has called them to. And then comes one of, if not the most comical verses in the Bible, Aaron's excuse. Maybe you saw this this week. Look at verse 24. Moses approaches him and, and asks kind of what's going on. Aaron says, I said to them, let any of them who, who take gold to take it off. If they have gold, take it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> right, you, if you have kids, you know. <laughs> You catch them doing something, right? And then they, they back up. And they, what, what, what had happened was, right, and they start to, to try to give you an excuse. And you're like, that, yeah, that's not going to fly. Right? It's, what, what's embedded here in, in Aaron's response is a confession of their sin and an avoidance of his, right? They brought me their gold, right? All of them. They took it off. They brought it to me. That's true. And yet he doesn't use the very language that's there, as we read early on, that he used a tool and fashioned for them this golden calf. And again, it's easy to look at this verse and just laugh. And go, Aaron, what are you thinking? That's the point. That all idolatry, there is no excuse. All of us, this is our excuse before God when it comes to idolatry. That's the point. That's why it's so comical. Because this is our excuse as well before God. Well, we'll see what happened was, what happened was you disobeyed. What happened was it didn't just pop out like this is magic. No, you fashioned for these people an image that you were called not to. So we must be quick to name our sin what it is. So again, I've used this statement before, but it's from the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late senator from New York. He called it defining deviancy down. Like we don't call sin what it is. Right? Adultery, as the Ten Commandments call it, is adultery. And then years ago, it was kind of misconstrued or renamed as infidelity or extramarital affair. I Googled, not Googled, I went to thesaurus.com this week. 
just typed in adultery. You know what one of the entries was? An extracurricular activity. Defining deviancy down. We don't call sin what it is. Aaron does that here. Look at, it's just magic. I don't know what happened. No, it's idolatry. Aaron, you broke the first and the second commandment. You were supposed to represent these people, and you didn't. And now we see the atrocity of this sin here. So the second point that we begin to look at, uh, picking up in verse 7 of chapter 32 through the end of chapter 33, is the, the adequacy of intercession. The, the adequacy of intercession. So now they begin to face dire consequences. Aaron has misled the people. They didn't trust God's promises. And so now come these consequences upon them. Look at verse 7 through 14. The Lord said to Moses, go down for your people. Interesting language, right? My wife says this to me occasionally. Go talk to your son, right? God says to Moses, go down for your people who you brought up out of the land of Egypt. They've corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They've made for themselves a golden calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, leave me alone. Let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. So I want to reduce all of them. I'm going to get rid of all of them. And Moses, then I'm going to just run with you. We'll start over with you. Notice Moses doesn't engage that. Like, you can imagine, like, the, the tendency to go, all right, God, let's go. And instead, verse 11, but Moses implored the Lord his God and said, oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel or Jacob, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, this covenant that you made and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I've promised, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken about bringing upon the people. So again, he says to Moses, these are your people, Right? And eventually Moses says, no, 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 this is, these are your people. And what's profound is this language that, uh, that's dis- used to describe God there in verse 10. My wrath b- burns hot against them. It's the very same language that is picked up eventually in verse 19 when Moses goes down the hill, uh, confronts the people. So he's, he's interceding for the people when it comes to his time face to face with God. And then when he approaches the people, it's not compassion. It's anger. This, his anger burned hot against them. Right? Again, God wants to start over. And yet Moses intercedes. Moses stands in the gap, reminds God of multiple things. And then he goes to the people. After God decides, you know what, I'm going, to, I'm going to spare them. God relents of the disaster in verse 14. So Moses goes to the people, his anger burning against them. Verse 19 says he took the tablets of stone that were in his hands and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. Throws down the, these, these tablets that God had used his own finger to, to inscribe the law and the commandments on and Moses throws them down before the people. Right? A profound statement, a picture for them of now what their relationship with God looks like. We go on to see in verse 28, 3,000 men are then killed. God, Moses commands him to go out to kill 3,000 of them. And then in verse 32 and following, or excuse me, verse 30 and following, again, this, this statement of you've sinned a great sin and now I'll go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make an atonement for your sin. So he decides to go back a second time to intercede for the people, returns to God and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. I'm not going to make excuses. What you've, what you've said is true. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, 
Please blot me out of your book that you have written. Profound statement here. So he says, forgive them or kill me. Forgive them or or take my life. It's a heart of an intercessor, the the mediator here. We see that Paul pick up the very same language in Romans chapter 9. He's broken hearted over the, the, the Israelites who are not understanding the gospel. They're their hard-heartedness toward the gospel. And he says, I wish that I could be cut off for the sake of my brothers. I wish that God would remove me from the book of life so that they would hear and they would understand and they could have eternal life. And eventually in verse 35, the Lord sends a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made, just in case anybody wasn't sure about this this excuse that he had there in verse 24. So they decide to worship like Egypt, and so God punishes them like Egypt. He sends a plague on them. And so you see these consequences, wrath and anger, 3,000 of them killed, the broken relationship, this plague. But it gets worse. Verses 1 to 3 in chapter 33, the Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and all the people, whom you've brought out of the land of Egypt to the land to which I swore, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to your offspring I'll give it. I'll send an angel before you, and I'll drive out the the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the the Hivites, the Jebusites. Go. He's saying, you go, take your people, I'll even clear the land for you. Go to this land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So if it couldn't get worse, God says, I'm not going with you. My anger against you would would make me consume you, eradicate you from the face of the earth. Then the people mourn. When people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. So eventually, verse 6, they're told to take off all of their ornaments, which then they do. Then they begin to now obey. And then by the time we get to verse 10, they're worshiping again. They see Moses worshiping at the entrance of his tent. So they would all rise up in the morning and and worship each at his own door to his tent. And now Moses goes a third time to intercede for the people. Again, he doesn't excuse their proneness to sin. He doesn't excuse it and just say, well, they're just, they're flesh. Right, they're offspring of Adam, they're weak. Doesn't say, well, boys will be boys. Ever heard that? Does not excuse their sin. None of those things are the basis of his intercession with God on behalf of the people. No, he appeals to God based upon his character, his promises, his faithfulness, his salvation, his covenant, his fame, his righteousness. He says ultimately to God, what makes us who we are is you. And if you're not going with us, then, if, then what's the point? We're not going. He says this in verse 16. How shall it be known that I found favor in your sight? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? So if, if you're not going with us, God, then there is no point in us going. Verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you've spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. So God agrees, he spares the people, he agrees to go. And one of the, the, the key questions in the Old Testament when we see this, with God sparing the people is how? How? They've just committed this heinous sin, and yet God spares them because of the words of Moses. All of these things point to the gospel. Paul says in Romans 3, verse 25, in his divine forbearance, God passed over former sins. So God knew there was a day coming when there would be a sacrifice, a sufficient sacrifice that would cover all of our sin. And so here, God is able to say, you're right. Because of my covenant, this unbreakable covenant that I've made with with you, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, I will go. Because ultimately, there's coming a day when that sacrifice is going to be made, right? And so Christ, our greater Moses, doesn't just look at God and say, forgive them or kill me. No, he says, forgive them by killing me. And this is what 
these, these passages like this point us forward to in the New Testament, that the guilty do go free, right? Because the guiltless one laid down his life for us. Alec Matir says, it wasn't for any goodness in them that he chose Israel in Egypt, and here their lack of of goodness didn't make him change his mind. From beginning to end, he loves us simply because he loves us, and the love which brought us out will bring us in. That's the profound truth for us this morning. God does not abandon us when we sin, right? If you feel abandoned by your God when you sin, when you blow it, when there's idolatry that's revealed in your heart, then you're not clinging to, you're not hoping in the God of the Bible. There's an idol in your hands. Because the the beautiful picture of who God is in this text is that he doesn't walk away. Matter of fact, he can't. Because of the eternal covenant that he's made throughout the Bible, ultimately in his son, he cannot walk away from us. Because the wrath has been finally poured out on Christ at the cross. So again, it's profound that chapters 32 to 34 come when they do. Right Last week in chapters 25 to 31, we see the instructions for the tabernacle. In chapters 35 to 40, we see the building of the tabernacle. And right there in the middle where we find ourselves this morning reveals the need for God's sanctifying presence with us. Because left to ourselves, right? John Calvin says our heart is a perpetual factory of idols. (laughs) The beautiful picture. Because left to ourselves, apart from God's intervening mercy, we'll be living in a world churned out by idols at every moment from our own hearts under the wrath of God. And yet that's not where we find ourselves. So the third point is there's an abundance of grace. We see this in chapter 34. So one of the things that we've seen throughout uh, chapter 29 and forward, when when God gives the, the law, moves forward, all of these, these pictures of the, the, the tabernacle and God dwelling among the people is that living in proximity to God brings holiness, right? So God pitches his tent among the camp. They're all encamped around it, and they're sanctified. They're made holy by God's glory. Remember, three times, some of them, even before the, the law was given, the people say, whatever God says, we're in. Right, whatever God has commanded, we're going to do. We're going to obey. And here we see that within 40 days, they, they prove they can't. Moses is up on the mountain getting all of the instructions for the tabernacle, and they've blown it. What's profound in moving forward in chapter 34 is that God doesn't change a single law to accommodate their sin. Listen to verse 1 in chapter 34. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself. You broke them, now cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. In other words, I'm not changing anything, Moses. The law still stands. Every word still stands. This duplicate copy of the law shows us a couple of things. Well, three is not a couple, it's a few. Three things. The holiness of God. Again, God does not change the the expectations for their holiness. It it too, it shows us the seriousness of sin. That the the bar is still set, right? When we approach that bar in the courtroom of God's justice, we are all guilty. And yet at the same time, it shows us the costliness of redemption. So earlier we see in chapter 32, Moses reminds God of who he is. All of these promises that he made And now God reminds Moses who he is before renewing the covenant, before reiterating the law and writing on these tablets a second time. But notice it's interesting that Moses is now on the mountain again for 40 days. Another test trial to see, are they going to to do it? So chapter 34, verses 5 to 7, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. What an amazing verse. God descends in the cloud, stands with him, and then proclaims his very name to Moses. Verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children and their children's children to the third and fourth generation. So it's amazing revelation to Moses about who, who God is. Again, Moses had reminded God of all these covenant promises, and now God says, let me, let me show you again who I am. And so you have two sides of, of the same coin here, the first in verses 6 and the first half of verse 7, and then this but in verse 7. So all this amazing grace and mercy toward the people, right? Slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, faithfulness, keeping steadfast love. This is, I've said this before, steadfast love, this phrase in the Old Testament is, is similar to the word gospel in New Testament. It's the Old Testament picture of God's relentless love for his people, right? No matter what gets in the way, there's an unstoppable, unbreakable love that God has for his people. That's what the word steadfast love means. It's the, the Hebrew word hesed. It's a beautiful word. Martin Luther says that the word uh, actually means kind of an active goodness, right? this goodness in action. It's not just a stagnant love. It's a pursuit of the people by God. But then this word but, but he will by no means clear the guilty. He will by no means clear them of their sin, visiting this iniquity. And so you see, even the, the, the two sides of this, both held in perfect tension. Again, because ultimately we see that God is able to do that in the cross. Romans 3, again, kind of talks about that God is both just and justifier. Right, so God is just in punishing the sin. So he holds true to the second half of, of verse 7. He doesn't clear the guilty. He punishes sin. Because he's just in meeting out judgment. And yet, he's the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So the first half of that is held in beautiful tension with the second half only when we understand the cross. Only when we see in texts like these the foreshadowing of Jesus coming and laying down his life for us. Tim Keller says there's no evil that the Father's love cannot pardon and cover. There is no sin that's a match for his grace. So this unfailing favor, this abundant grace that God has, right, this, you, you see that all bound up in these words, abounding in steadfast love. It means there is no sin in your life Yesterday, today, next week, next year, a decade from there's no sin in your life that will outspend this abundant grace that God has for you. And so Moses' response here in verses 8 to 10, Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, now I've found favor in your sight, O Lord. Please let the Lord go in the midst of us. Where was Moses when they were sinning? Do you remember? He's on the mountain with God. And yet he puts himself in this confession. Let him go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. It's profound. Again, the, the, the heart that Moses has for the people. This offer of, let's wipe them out, Let's wipe them out. We'll start fresh with you, Moses. And you see, Moses, who wasn't even there, puts himself in this confession, God, be with us. Take us. Yes, we're stiff-necked, but pardon us. Clear us of guilt. Wipe us clean. Wash us. Take us for your inheritance. Moses is worshiping here. This is the appropriate response when we see God's mercy and God's grace toward us. Because there's this stiff-necked people have been pardoned, right? We have been pardoned. We were declared innocent. And then most of the rest of chapter 34 are all these reiterations of the covenant. He's going to say a lot of the things he's already said in the giving of the law. Verse 17, you shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. It's almost the very same language that's used in chapter 32 when Aaron is there forming this idol. And so he warns them of the idolatry that's going to come. If you don't drive out these people, then they're going to be a snare for you. What's interesting is they're in the desert, right? They're not yet in the promised land. They're, 
They're no longer living in Egypt, and yet the idolatry is there in their own heart. They don't have to wait to the promised land. They don't have to wait till other cultures are present for idolatry to, to show its, its head. But then Moses comes down to the people, verses 29 and following, and this is the last statement that's made that kind of drives home the point of their idolatry. I said earlier that they become what they worship, and these two instances of them being stiff-necked and breaking out. And there's one point that drives home this, this point for them. It's kind of embedded in verses 29 to 35. So Moses comes down, his face is shining. Right? The text says Moses' face shone. Right? Maybe you've seen artwork like this. Uh, there's a sculpture like the one on the right uh, at the, uh, one of the museums in D.C. I can't remember what it was now. The Library of Congress. Right? So this is a picture of Moses. And, and the question is, what's up with his head? Right? So the, the word that's used, and it's only found in a couple of older translations, but it's the same word for shown as it is for horned. So one translation says in verse 29, it's a translation from 1899, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he held two tablets of the testimony, and he knew not that his face was horned from the conversation of the Lord. So this glory that's radiating from his face. Probably no one was there, there's no pictures. But this dual perspective, this dual use of the word shown or horned, right? So he comes down. Right, the horns are symbols of power and a public rebuke of the people of their own idolatry, their own fake and false attempts of trying to conjure up something of power. And Moses comes down his face radiating with the glory of God, horned with the very glory of God, reminding them of their failed attempts. You, you can't conjure up. You're trading this. You're exchanging this Golden calf that you've made for the very glory of God. You want power? Here it is. You can't make it for yourself. There's a deep longing in our hearts to worship something visible, tangible. We see that's what they want. They want something to cling to. In Christ, the invisible is made visible. So the reason the second commandment is so profound, do not make for yourself any other images and that while we saw last week, there are no images, no icons, no, no pictures, no statues in the most holy place, is because God is reserving that image for another. And we see that when we get to the New Testament. Paul says in Colossians 1, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's why Jesus says in John 14, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So we don't worship images because God has emblazoned his very nature and his very image on the person of his son. And so now to worship Christ is to worship God, to see Christ, to behold him is to see and behold the face of God. So this grace that comes is far greater still. This power that, that they're willing to exchange is greater still than the, the idolatry in their hearts. It's greater than the idolatry in our own hearts. God's abundant grace is greater than the atrocity of our sins. And again, that's all possible through a mediator. Let me pray for us as the worship team comes to close us